Is everybody doing okay tonight? All right, well, I got quiet quick. Let's start with a word of prayer. Can I get one of the brothers to lead us in it? Thank you, Bill. I thought I would start tonight with a little bit of a, um, it's not a rabbit trail, but a, a digression a little bit, um, mostly because I, I um, past two Wednesday nights after class have had good discussions, people asking questions a little bit more um, about the concept of, of Jesus and Joshua and what's the relationship and, and, uh, and drawing lines between the Old Testament story and and um, how, how do we know that Jesus is like Joshua and things like that. And if you remember, um, part of the answer to that is very first week of the quarter, um, uh, we looked at Hebrews 3 and 4, right, where the Hebrew writer talks about if Joshua had given them rest, you know, then there wouldn't have remained more work to be done. But the whole idea is that, you know, Jesus shows up because what Joshua did really wasn't the true rest for the people of God in the promised land. That makes sense? Yes, no. Okay, you with me? All right. So, but what the Hebrew writer is doing there and, and looking at Old Testament stories and saying, actually, actually, um, that story is really something bigger and it's not been finished yet. And the Hebrew writer does this a lot all through the book with a number of other Old Testament stories and things. Um, is a concept that we often call typology. We use that term from time to time. It's a biblical term. Uh, it's not often translated that way, but the, the word and the concept are there um, in the New Testament Greek. Um, they're often translated, I think, like, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 10, where it talks about Israel's failures are a warning or an example to us. In Greek, that's not the word. The word is not warning or example. That's a very loose idea. The idea is that they are a type. They are an image. So I want so so typology goes beyond just something is is like another thing or similar. Um, typology biblically goes into the idea that there is a historical correspondence. There is a there is an actual line between specific events. It's not just that they're like something, that one's an example of another but that there is a, an actual correspondence in the mind of God. And so here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a little digression because this is actually a very important biblical concept that is almost completely misunderstood or not understood at all today. And it actually helps us make sense. We're not going to have time to chase it this far tonight. But it helps us make sense of some other problematic passages and concepts um, that sometimes Christians get a little bit um, hung up on. Helps us make a lot better sense of the book of Revelation rather than just making it into you know weird monsters at the end of the world kind of stuff. Um, when you understand that this is how God runs history. So I want to start with um, an illustration to help us understand something. Um, and you can be turning in the meantime in your Bible of, of all places. I'm going to go to Hebrews. Uh, um, actually, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 1 first. Ephesians chapter 1. Um, so you can go there. So here's the thing. Um, ever familiar you know, with a typewriter? Yes. Well, I mean, so, you know, some of you under 40 may not, but, um, but, but everyone gets what a typewriter is, right? And by the way, that word typewriter, the, the term itself comes from this actual concept um, of tupas, of types. Um, and how does a typewriter work? Anybody remember? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Between laughter and only one person took it seriously. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's right. And those of you under 40, there's a YouTube video somewhere on this. No, um, yeah, there, there's a little, little, right, little hammer, and it comes up and it hits the little ink ribbon, right? And that knocks it in, into, the, into the paper, um, and what's left is the letter. You know, you, you, you press the key for the letter T on the keyboard, and a little hammer comes up. With, with If you ever looked at the little hammer, I remember when I was a kid, typewriters were still around, so we used to like to play with them and tinker with them. Yeah, that, I know that was an ugly, ugly aside. Um, <laughs> but anyways, you know, it was always inverted. It was, it was not exactly the same thing, but you could see the correspondence. And so the truth of the matter is, and the reason they were called typewriters was because the way a typewriter worked was it left an image on the piece of paper of the real thing. You with me? It leaves an image. It's the actual what's left on the on the uh, on the paper is not the thing itself. It's an image of it. That's how it works. The thing itself is on the little hammer. You with me? 
and thus it was called a typewriter. It left behind images of the real thing, but, the real, but there was a direct correspondence between the image on the paper and the thing itself. They were directly connected. One created the other. You with me? Okay, this is a really important concept. I think it's one of the easiest ways from most, mostly everyday life, used to be everyday life, to begin to get our minds around this. The, the thing itself and the image were directly connected. One made the other, but they were not the same thing. Um, all right, so understand that. Go with me. I should get there too. Book of Ephesians chapter 1. Go back to how Paul describes the nature of reality itself. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And I will get there too. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, we're not going to worry about how that's not Calvinism and God didn't preordain individuals. The point I want you to see here, and this is going to come up a couple different times in this paragraph, the idea, though, is before God, but before anything happens, before there's history, before God starts creating things, God God's already got a, a, an image of what he's up to. He already has an idea of what he's trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? You see what Paul's saying? Before the foundation of the world, before God ever said, let there be light, God had an idea of what he wanted to accomplish. Okay? God literally starts with the end in mind before there's even a beginning. Literally before in the beginning happens. He's already got the end in mind. You're with me? You see that? That's what Paul's saying. Um, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be wholly blameless in, uh, before him. In love he predestined us. Again, not going to worry about the Calvinistic overtones and how that scares us, but just understand, again, he had this in mind before the beginning. Predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Again, intentionality. He has this in mind. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, that's talking about Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of trespasses, according to the riches of grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. He begins to share with us what his goal is. That's revelation. Uh, that's where God speaks to us through the prophets and then last through Jesus. According to the purpose which he set forth in Christ. So Christ is the ultimate purpose. What God starts with in the beginning is, yes, he wants a people, but he wants a people created through Jesus. And that's what's got to be revealed and explained to us. As a plan for the fullness of time. This is what, so when all is done, the fullness of time, when all is done, when all of history is over, to unite all things in him, that's talking about Christ, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So at the end of the day, everything adds up to Christ. Christ, in one sense, absorbs everything. Everything is for him. Everything is through him, by him. Paul talks about this in a different kind of way, but somewhat similar in Colossians 1. So God starts with this idea of Jesus, and through Jesus, a people. And then he says, let's get busy. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, so he starts with a goal, with, an, with a purpose, with an image. You with me? He starts with what the letter is. And then what he's going to do is he's going to create and he's going to run history in a way to make these images, these types, pop, pop, pop through history. Because he's already know, he already knows what he's up to and what he wants to accomplish, right? That's the concept of typology. That because God had the end in, be, uh, in mind from the beginning. Uh, turn the page to chapter 3, um, verse 9 beginning. Ephesians chapter 3, now verse 9. That, that you know, through the gospel now, what is brought to light for everyone is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be now made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized or accomplished in Christ Jesus. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day now, because after the crucifixion and resurrection, God can begin, because he's revealed Christ, can now begin to connect the dots and show us how everything that he's created, so much of what he's done through history, were meant to be intentionally, from the beginning, images, types of Christ or Christ's work. That makes sense? And that's now what he's revealing. And that's now what he's revealing. And so again, you think all the way back to Isaiah chapter 46, when God says, once one of the things that makes me God is I know the end from the beginning. That's part of why I'm God. And even idols don't have this kind of power. 
because idols can only work within history. They can be surprised. The, the false gods can react maybe to something humans do, but I'm the only one who's never surprised. I've already got it all accounted for. That's why history is always in my control. Make sense? Okay. So understanding that, then you flip back to books like Hebrews. Hebrews doesn't use the word typology, but it uses the word, the, the concept quite frequently. Whether it's back in chapters three and four, if Joshua had given them rest, there would not yet remain another rest that now the true Joshua, Jesus, remember we talked about his name, Jesus' name is literally in, in, in Hebrew and Aramaic, it's Joshua, Yoshua. Um, th that's why he got the same name, because he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people. He gets the name too, because he's accomplishing the true salvation and bringing people into God's eternal rest. But in chapter, oh, is it about chapter eight? I think that's where I want to be. Yeah, chapter eight. Um, the concept, the, 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 the technical term is not used, but the concept is there pretty cleanly. Um, chapter 8, beginning of verse 1. I'm going to jump through a couple of places here in, in chapters 8 and 9 real quick. Um, now, the point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who was seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. How can he say that? What does he mean by that? What does he mean in the true tent? Yeah, so what's not the true tent? Tabernacle and temple. So why was there ever a tabernacle and temple? It was a type. It was a type. It was an image in history. Boom. Like a typewriter leaves an image of what God is really up to. Uh, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 8, 1 and 2. Make sense? Heber doesn't use the word, but he's very much working the concept. This is a very biblical concept, but one we've really lost sight of. And it's spread all throughout the Bible. Um, all right, Turn, uh, still in chapter 8, read a little bit further. Um, verse 5, speaking of, of the, the Levitical priests, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So here's the thing. We often sometimes, we get it backwards. We think God makes a tabernacle and has them build a temple and puts furniture in it and gives them sacrifices in the priesthood. And then God says, Jesus is like that. No, 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 no. What the Hebrew is actually saying is it's the, exactly the other way around. God started with this eternal purpose. Jesus, a priesthood for him, a temple that's actually his own people. And then he makes images in history for us to better understand what he's up to in his eternal purpose. Does that make sense? It's completely the other way around. There's a sense in which you read the Bible backwards to understand what it's really about. Um, and you'll notice the other word the Hebrew writer used there, and this is a good word to help us understand this concept as well. We use the word typewriter because that's a modern way of getting at this. But there's another word there that he uses, the word shadow. A shadow looks like the thing, but is not the thing itself, right? But here's the catch. When you see a shadow of a person, say around the corner of a building, you can't see the person, you can see their shadow. Can you necessarily tell whether it's a man or a woman? Not in 2022, you can't. No, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. But, 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 but work with me here broadly, right? Can you, tell, can you tell what color their clothes are? No. When you go around the corner, though, does all that detail get filled in? And now you know what you've been looking at the whole time. So our experience in history has been we're looking at shadows. You saw the tabernacle, you saw the temple, you saw lambs sacrificed on an altar for sin, et cetera, et cetera. You're looking at shadows, but not the thing itself, which is why the Jews, when Jesus shows up and says, I am he, they can't get past their shadow image, just thinking their shadows are the real thing and recognize how he actually fills in in full living color. All the details a shadow could never give. Make sense? And, um, and, and so again, the Hebrew does this over and over again. Chapter 12, you've not come to a mountain that can be touched. Uh, and there he's mimicking the true heavenly mountain from which God dwells and the earthly counterpart of Sinai. Sinai was a top, or a type. Sinai was a type of God's presence, right? So uh, what he was saying is over and over again throughout the Bible, God ran history in a way. So like a typewriter, pop, pop, pop. He's leaving images of what he's really up to. But the problem is, until you come around the corner, it's hard to understand what the shadow really is and how powerful it is, how beautiful it is. Um, listen, when I see a shadow of a person, they may be really good looking or they may be really ugly. I don't know until I go around the corner. That was a harsh example, but you get the point. <laughs> 
I'm not saying it was anybody in this room. I'm just saying it <laughs> hypothetically. So go with me to Luke chapter 24 and watch what happens after Jesus comes. This is one of the most important. And it is, Luke's gospel is the only one who tells this story, but it's a really crucial one. Even after the resurrection, are disciples getting it? No. No. Even though Jesus comes along and does his bit, and he, re- and he tells them about scriptures and prophecies, and even though he works miracles and does things that even they admit, what kind of man is this? Who could this be? They're still not getting it, which is why they're still scared on the third day when they should have been saying, oh, it's the third morning. Let's go meet him. And when the women come back from the tomb, do they believe? No. Luke 24, the unique story of the trip of the two disciples to Emmaus. Really important what happens here. Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near uh, and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They still weren't getting it. They, 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 they couldn't see something that wasn't a shadow still. Um, and they said, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And then one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor of Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? That is one of my favorite lines in the Bible. <laughs> Boy, is that going to be awkward in about three verses. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he knew. Um, but just, but again, so thoroughly oblivious they are. Um, and he said to them, what things? And so he plays along and makes them do the thinking first. What do you make of what's happened? What things? And they said concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. But we... You know, the two guys traveling there, and the other disciples, surely, but, but he and his buddy who were walking along here, we, and notice the verb tense here, this, this kind of matters, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So what does that make it sound like? Well, you know, it was nice while it lasted. You know, we'll always have that summer. It was great while it lasted. But must not have been him. And why would they think that? didn't work out um but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem israel yes and besides all this it is now the third day since these things happened moreover some women of our company amazed us they were at the tomb early in the morning and when they did not find his body they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive and some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman said but him they did not see so are they connecting the dots? Third day, empty tomb. They got all the details right, by the way? They got all the details right. Why would they make a big deal about the third day? Because before he died, what did he say? The third day matters. And look at what happens next. This is, this is the crucial part. Look at what Jesus says. O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What's different today when they read their Old Testament from when they read their Old Testament two weeks before? It's not a shadow anymore. And they just got to get used to looking into the bright sunlight. You ever come out of a dark room for a while? It takes a while for your eyes to adjust. You can't even tell what color of shirt someone has on because you're not quite there yet. Yeah, you've been looking in darkness for a long time, but now, bang, bright as the sun. And so now, because it's all happened, because it's not a shadow anymore, the actual thing God had in mind before the foundation of the world has come to pass, or at least the beginning of what God has had in mind before the foundation has come to pass. He can sit down with them, open up the book, and say, yeah, in living color now, let me show you how this works. Because now it's not a shadow anymore. That makes sense? That is a crucially important conversation. There is a sense in which why Jesus sometimes chastised them, and maybe he chastised them in particular because they do have the key now. They had all the details right. They remembered exactly what he said. Third day, empty tomb. Nobody's seen him. Well, if it's an empty tomb, you're not going to see him. What were you expecting? Go there and 
well, that's going to be awkward. So anyways, um, now that it has happened, God expects people to begin to figure it out. He's given you the key. He's shown you the thing that he's always been up to. Make sense? So when you understand that, it really does some interesting things in other parts of the Bible. Um, like, for instance, go with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. Here's what we would normally consider messianic prophecy. But I want you to notice how the text reads. Um, let's see, for sake of time, I want to pick up. I'm in Ezekiel, chapter 34. I'm going to begin reading in verse 20. Again, what we would generally understand is Messianic prophecy, but notice how it's actually worded. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Don't worry about those details. They're not important for tonight. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flock and they shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. Now, is there anything that kind of surprises you when you read that? David's dead. He doesn't say son, a son of David, because we all knew that God made a covenant with David's house, right? We all know about that. Yeah, and so the, that's why the Jews are looking for a messianic son of David to show up. In fact, I mean, remember, like, what's the man by the side of the road? Cry to Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But that's not what this passage says. This passage says who's coming? Not a son of David. David. How can Ezekiel say that? Because there it is because the true David hadn't shown up yet. Because shepherd boy David knocks down Goliath, his king, etc., is the image. And when Moses, before he dies in Deuteronomy 18, says, the Lord will raise up unto me a prophet like unto you. Who's he talking about? Jesus. What makes Moses and Jesus unique among all the prophets? All other prophets simply enforce covenants. Only two prophets bring the covenant. Moses brought the covenant. Jesus brought the covenant. Whose covenant lasts? Whose covenant is the eternal one? Ah, because he's the real image of which Moses was just the typewriter left the mark. And so you got a prophet, you got priest, you got king. See how God has basically, he started with the image in mind from the beginning. Jesus and through Jesus a people. And so now you begin to understand like when Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 says that Israel is a warning to us. Don't die in the wilderness the way they did. No, they're a type. They're an image. Don't finish the image that they made because we are supposed to be the eternal people of God, not the dying people of God in the wilderness, right? Now you begin to understand why Peter can say in 1 Peter's chapters 1 and 2. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, he calls us the people of the exile. Well, the exile of Israel was a type of humanity's exile from the promised land of God, from God's presence, right? So that's why Peter can talk that way, call us people of the exile. Because now as Christians, we recognize that humanity is what's in exile from the presence of God to which we want to return. But then in 1 Peter chapter 2, look at what Peter does. You are a chosen race. I'm in verse 9. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Um, now, what do all those terms have in common that he just piled up? They're all terms for Israel somewhere in the Old Testament. Why can he do that? Because Israel of the flesh was not the real Israel. They were a image. What's the true Israel that God always intended? The people that are gathered not through Moses, but gathered through the type of, the, the, the antitype of Moses, Jesus himself. Two men made a nation. Only one of them is the true eternal people of God. Make sense? And so what happens over and over again in the Bible then is, is what the Bible is trying to tell us is God literally started with the end in mind and created, made a creation and ran history in a way so that he has placed abundant images of what his eternal purpose is all over the place. And now this side of the cross, you've been given the key to make sense of it all. Make sense? Um, yeah, please. Sure. Where? Whereabouts? Oh, oh, Scotland, okay. 
Um, depends on what, you, as we all know, um, the word church is used in a couple different senses <laughs> in, the, uh, in the New Testament. So it probably depends on which sense you want to use it in. I think that the church itself, understood in its most global and universal sense, is the end. And by that, I mean the, the, you know, the way Paul often uses church in Ephesians, which is kind of the, the universal gathering of all of God's people of all times and all places, not the local church in any one particular place on earth in any particular century or place on the world at any given moment. Oh, sure, in, in, in a limited sense, in that, yes, I mean, you know, we, you know, we at our best are a gathering of Jew and Gentile, all races, all nations gathered together to worship the Lord together. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, we, we do, in that limited sense, still portray God's intended eternal reality. But, but most fully, but, you know, but this church can become unfaithful. This church could split. This church could, and in that sense, we, we are not the, the, you know, the ultimate image is that universal gathering. Um, so, but yeah, good question. Is that, is that, okay. Yes, sir, David. I think I'm, I'm assuming that there's no record in the Bible or elsewhere sources where anybody plainly put all the scriptures together just from that standpoint at all and could trace the line of, in, in a sense, from scripture proof that Christ really was who he said he was, just from a scriptural. You mean outside the Bible? I mean, I'm trying to. Out. Well, I mean, I, w I would think that, I mean, I, I may not be understanding the question. Well, I mean, we have some people that, well, Christ himself, you pointed to scripture. Sure. But we don't have any grand person that has said, no, wait a minute, I, I'm going to lay it all out for you. From the beginning oh, beginning. systematic, like a systemized, no, because I mean, even, we, even, the gen even in history, not just Bible, no one is, because, because it's constantly amazing why did why didn't they? Because yeah. It's all there. Right. Well, and, and that's. But they, they couldn't see it because the end result didn't look like they. If I think if I'm getting what you're getting at, then yeah, you know, so here's part of the thing. There's a one sense, yeah, it's never systematized because even in the New Testament, you know, right, the Hebrew writer's bringing out little bits and pieces, but not all of it. Yeah. You know, for, for, for his purpose, he's bringing out bits and pieces. So you want you to see the, the Sinai-Zion connection or the wilderness promise, or the, uh, the promised land heaven connection, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, part of the thing is because at the end of the day, it's really meant to be a person, you know, that, you know, just like you can't boil God down to an image. Right, you know that's why God in the in the, in the uh, Ten Commandments, not only no graven images of other gods, but no graven images of me. Because if you can draw me, depict me, sculpt me, your view of me is way too small. I can't be depicted. And so, by the same token, there's a sense in which when you go back to you know Paul's language in Ephesians and Colossians, that all things are in him, through him, by him, for him. That he, you know, all things in heaven and earth are in, you know absorbed into him. Um, you know, that there's a sense in which we still don't fully comprehend the enormity of the God-man. Nor are we meant to. Mm. I mean, I, I think that's, that's part of it, right? Yeah. So. What we and what we have yeah, But these things are written that you may believe. <laughs> that's right. But that's the thing is, you know, it goes back to, you know, boys, so much ink has been spilt literally over the centuries and so much heresy has been produced accordingly when ultimately we go too far in trying to comprehend you know, when people begin to try to explain how we can be both fully God and fully man at the same time. You know, if he's, if he's really God and he's omniscient at all times, how can, when he's asleep as a baby in the manger, how does that, you know, bad things happen when you start trying to unravel what's unravelable. Unravelable. Yeah, something like that. You're laughing, which means you know what I meant. Uh, <laughs> anybody else? Oh, yes, ma'am. Put my glasses back on. Yeah. Yep, it's interesting. The Bible does drop hints that there were always a few, a very few, but a few who came closer to getting it than others. And Simeon and Anna seem to be on that list. Um, by the way, so that, you know, going back to just, you know, really the wonders of how God runs the world, don't ever try to guess what God's up to. You would think that people devout like Anna and Simeon would be like, you know, he'd use Simeon as an apostle, man. I mean, that's, you know... If you're going to have you know, somebody who gets it, who's going to help everybody else get it, you know, pick Simeon. Why do you put Peter, James, and John at the top of the list? Um, when those guys can't get, you know, James and John are fighting over who's the greatest, and Peter says, I'll never deny you. And we all know how those stories turned out. Um, and yet those are the guys he actually chooses as his inner three. 
and Simeon gets to see him as a baby and dies. Well, that's because God just doesn't play by the same rules you and I evaluate what's wise and what's not. <laughs> he's, he's playing chess on a whole other level from us. So, good. Anything else? Does that help? Does that make sense then, part of, of, of how the Bible works and why we call this class Joshua and Jesus and then kind of want to play a little bit with, with the way Jesus comes along to embody and complete the work that the book of Joshua depicts as a beginning where literally they actually share the same name. Does that make sense? Other comments or questions on that? I thought we were kind of coming full circle on that. So Jesus is, I'm thinking of mm -hmm. Moses now. Mm -hmm. And Jesus shows the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, I think that's right, Becca. I think that's right. Um, you know, and, and where we do kind of come to David, I, I think actually a, a sub point of what I think what you were getting at a second ago, David, is and actually bad things happen when you try to systematize it. How can he be both Moses and Joshua? No, the issue is Jesus is so big, you have to break them out into individual human lives that aren't Jesus because only Jesus can contain multitudes in a sense. So yes, there is a sense in which he is, even though Moses and Joshua are two different men with two different roles, Jesus can be both of those at the same time. That's it. That's it. Yep, that's right. You know, back to remember Paul in Romans 5, he's the Adam, you know, he's the true human. You know, God never got the true human he wanted. And so Jesus shows up and does the Adam role too, even. He does, you know, it's like, you know, you know the, the human story starring Jesus. And that's literally what the Bible wants us to understand. He plays all the roles correctly. And finally, God has what he wants, what he intended before he created at the beginning. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's it. That's it. That's right. That's right. And and again, so that's the the, the idea is as and as uh, Stephen Colbert put it once time in an interview with a biblical skeptic in which he ate him alive, which is unusual for Stephen Colbert. Um, but he's actually a devoutly religious man, and he had a religious scholar on one time. I showed the clip in, in some young people's classes. I do sometimes. It's actually hilarious to watch a mainstream late night talk show host make make a fool of a scholarly atheist. Um, but he does. He eats him alive. But he's but a great closing line. So Jesus is kind of like an elephant. Um, <laughs> it's literally where he winds up with um, humiliating this biblical scholar. It, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful clip. Um, I, I do. I, I'm, I'm tear, tears and smiles are coming right now. Um, it's very effective with young people when they watch, you know, somebody whose books are on the shelves at Barnes and Noble get publicly humiliated on national television. Um, at a place you don't normally expect that. Normally, it's a sympathetic audience. Um, but yeah, I mean, he is—he's an elephant. I mean, that—that's the thing. And by the way, along that line too, though, one other thing. So his work also similarly defies simple description. You know, people talk about theories of the atonement and how, how his death saves us, et cetera. You know, and is it a ransom or is it a pardon or is it a, you know, and that's the whole point. The New Testament uses a ton of different metaphors and analogies because no one metaphor or analogy completely describes the divine transaction that happens that I think only God and Jesus can fully understand at some level. Does that make sense? And, 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 and so you know, one minute it's, it's propitiation, you know, something designed to appease a wrathful God. And another minute it's Jesus saying, I've come to redeem, to buy back. Well, which is it? Is it an angry God being, being appeased or is it redeemed from slavery to sin? Or is it? Yes, all of it. No one analogy or metaphor or image, again, captures, if, you, if nothing captures him, nothing captures the enormity of his work. As far as well, like the Israelites being saved through the Red Sea. And oh, Noah being saved is that a type? And then the end. Well, yeah. I mean, Paul says it is. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that, that that's Paul's point back in First Corinthians, right? You know, as he's warning us not to die in the wilderness, i.e., before we get to eternity, like they did, because they were baptized as we were baptized, and their passing through the Red Sea was a national baptism, whereas we come in individually now. Because um, you've got to remember, that was a national covenant, whereas part of what makes the new covenant different is nobody has to be taught to know the Lord. Why? Because if you're in this covenant, you're here because you knew the Lord. That's not how it worked with Mosaic law, right? I'm born a Jewish baby, and now I'm Jewish. I was born that way, so I have to be taught the implications of my Jewishness, the implications of my circumcision. Um, but yeah, I mean, Paul's point is, yeah, I mean, they were baptized too. So I think baptism, I don't think it's quite as broad or possibly imponderable. 
but yeah, I mean, th there are a number of analogies at the New Testament. It's it's the passing through the sea. It's the burial in Romans six. It's uh, it's analogous to the flood in First Peter three, um, when Noah is saved by water. Um, so yeah, there are a number of analogies that the New Testament will tap on for that one too, to try to help us understand the significance of. Uh, when God delivers, and, and part of the, the pattern is, going back to typology, what's the pattern? God saves by water. That's his, that's his pattern. may surprise you how he does it, but if somebody's going to be saved, there's probably some water involved in there somewhere, because that's how God works. And so again, 20 big ideas in the Bible. Once you figure it out, it's all theme and variation, just like a symphony theme and the variations over the movements. God has, everything's, a, everything's types of what God's up to. And so you have type scenes in the book of Genesis. Um, if you have a young man by a well, he's probably going to find a wife. That's just how it works in Genesis. Um, <laughs> seriously, go home and read it tonight. That's how it works. You're laughing because, yeah, it, 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 that's how it works. Um, you, meet, you meet women at wells in Genesis. Um, moving on. Moses is saved by water. Um, going back to, you know, right, because he's put in, in the ark. And by the way, that is the only two times that Hebrew word for ark is used is, is in Genesis and in the, the little thing that Moses has put in. It's meant to be, again, an image, an echo of Moses being saved from death by water. Um, so on and on it goes. Moses is... Um, uh, you know, Jesus' flight to Egypt for, salva you know, for salvation. You know, the, the, the Gospels link that to, out of Egypt I have called my son again. All over the Bible, images, the stories repeat themselves, theme and variation. Why do we know this is biblical? Because God himself says, this is what I'm up to. I started with the end in mind, and I have run history in a way so that it keeps on repeating in some way the image of what I've created and what I'm accomplishing. Pretty cool, actually. So, and that really does open up things like Revelation. It keeps us from making a mess of Revelation when you understand that the capstone book of the Bible is itself kind of the ultimate senior thesis of this way of reading the Bible. Then, if you really understand that, you won't make such a hash of Revelation. Yeah, Joel. Absolutely. No, that's right. And that's an excellent point um, uh, to what you're saying. I, th I think, um, you know, what Joel's getting at, you know, that, that we understand through metaphors and analogy, that's actually been borne out by, like, psychology and, and, and research and whatnot, that how we learn is actually by analogy. We make sense of things by comparing one thing to another. That's literally how we learn. And so you would expect that the God who made humans what we are, made our nature and placed it in us, would then, again, if he wants us to know and understand him in some way, make a creation and, um, and a... Uh, make a creation and run a history in a way so that that works. And by the way, we haven't done much with this because we've talked more about events tonight, but creation itself is meant to teach us as well. It's meant to be um, shadows and images. That's why God, for instance, he doesn't look around and say, okay, I need something to compare myself to. Uh, the sun will work. No, I think the right understanding is God. when God's making the world, I'll, you know, I'll make a sun that will serve my function in creation so that when I need something to compare myself to in certain aspects, it's there. Or when Paul needs an image to talk about resurrection, when he uses the seed and the tree, God's, you know, God's built the world in a way so that it already images the whole you die and out of death comes new life. That's called a seed. God built the world to look that way in the first place. So that, uh, so that, again, he has ready-made stock of, if you want to understand me, just look at things. Which is, by the way, why it's so dangerous that in our technological age, the further we get from nature, the less we understand God and the more we rebel against God. Technology is always a way of eclipsing the divine image and, getting, and then becoming arrogant and saying we can remake the divine image. Hence, sex change surgery and things like that. We, we think we, because we have the ability, we can remake, rather than looking at the, the old male and female, the way the Bible tells us, and learn the image of Christ and the church and marriage. Again, God made it that way, knowing what he's up to. He makes male and female that way. He makes marriage that way, intending them to serve this purpose. And now we have destroyed them. Oh, no. Correct. 
because history repeats itself. And so Babel, it's, and that's why Babel becomes Babylon and all the way to the book of Revelation, the quintessential city of man. The literal place changes, but the type doesn't. So that's right. All right, that was the bell. See you next week.